in all circumstances, we are grateful, and we can find the chair of gratitude. And the last scene, he, the dad, moved her, his daughter to the seat. He taught about the gratitude in any circumstances. It's a great message he has. On Thursday, we'll all be gathering together with our family, and hopefully we will remember to do more than eat a meal and watch football or be ready to go to shopping on Black Friday. In fact, the Thanksgiving holiday gives us a perfect opportunity to transform our lives from those of griping and dissatisfaction to lives of joy and gratitude. God wants nothing more than for us to be people of thanksgiving and gratitude because God wants us to be happy and more grateful we are, the happier we are. So somebody said, a thankful spirit is one of the key distinguishing marks of a Christian. And I agree with it because I can't imagine a Christian of anger and discontent while they are saying grace. In this Thanksgiving season, I think the following gratitude stories might be helpful to you. They all fall under the theme of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 18. Take a look at the screen. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Of course, it doesn't say that everything that happens to us is God's will. It's not God's will that we lose our jobs or get a diagnosis of cancer or that our children make poor choices to walk the wrong path. What this verse really means is it's God's will for us to grateful for people in all circumstances, even in hard times, especially in hard times. Think of these three examples. When Robinson Crusoe was wrecked on his lonely island, he drew two columns and listed the good and the bad of his situation. He was cast away on a desolate island, but he was still alive. He was separated from humanity, but he was not starving. He had no clothes, but he was in a warm climate and didn't need them. He had no means of defense, but he was no wild beast that threatened him. He had no one to talk to, but the destroyed ship was near the shore, and he could get out of it all the things necessary for his basic needs. And he concluded that no condition in the world was so miserable that one could not find something to be grateful for. The second story. In the late John Claypool, John Claypool, who was the renowned minister and, and the author, lost his 10-year-old daughter to leukemia. He found that gratitude was the only way he could survive. Um, he tells about the experience in the profound book titled Tracks of a Fellow Struggler. After his daughter's death, John walked down three different paths. The first pass was to say, yes, it's just God's will. I have to accept it. But it turned out that was not helpful at all. He couldn't believe that God willed 10-year-old girls to die of leukemia. A second pass was to try to find an intellectual answer as to why it happened. He tried to make sense of it, but it didn't work either. His, daughter, his daughter's death didn't make any sense of. And finally, John made a choice to walk the path of gratitude. And suddenly he realized that life is a gift. We are not entitled to it. It's just given. That we have any life at all is pure gift and pure grace. Therefore, John chose to be thankful for the 10 good years they had together, rather than being consumed with resentment for the years he didn't have with her. 
And it says, of course, this path, was, this path of gratitude was not easy, but it was the only path that offered him any help and comfort. Gratitude was the only hope for his survival. And third story, many years ago, an old pastor was famous for his pulpit prayers. He always found something to thank God for even in bad times when one stormy Sunday morning, when everything was going extremely bad in the community and in the lives of many people in the congregation, and himself included, um, he stepped into the uh, pulpit to pray. A member of the congregation thought to himself, the preacher will have nothing to thank God for on, the, on this wretched morning like this. And the pastor began the prayer, we thank you, Lord, that it is not always like this. Folks, you got the stories of the, the points of the stories. Most of us think that our gratitude and happiness is determined by our circumstances. But actually, it's not. We don't determine our thanksgiving on the basis of how much we have. Do I have enough money in my bank account? Am I healthy enough? Do I have enough turkey to gorge myself sufficiently? Something like that. Our gratitude and happiness is not actually dependent on how well things go for us. But the truth is, our gratitude and happiness is determined by our attitude and perspective on life. When I visit Dave Brinkmeyer, I share the stories I shared last Sunday about my story in America for the last seven years. I said I showed the pictures of my um, history in America, and he just asked me, how do you like America? What do you think about America? What I said is this, America is a country of grace. Country of grace. And he lost words, and he just cried again. You know what? Our happiness and gratitude is determined by our attitude and perspective on life. It's really in how we see things around us. That's our perspective on life. I heard about a college student. She wrote a letter to her parents from college. She said this, Dear mom and dad, I have, I have so much to tell you and sorry I haven't written sooner. My arm really has been broken and I broke my left leg too when I jumped from the second floor of my dormitory when we had the fire. But we were lucky. A young service station attendant saw the blaze and called the fire department and they got there just in a few minutes. I was in the hospital for a few days. Paul, the service station attendant, came to see me every day. He, was, he has been so nice to me. And because it was taking so long to get our dorm livable again, I moved in with him. And I dropped out of the school when I found out that I was pregnant. Paul and I plan to get married as soon as he can get a divorce. And we are going to move to Alaska. I'm sorry, your loving daughter, Susie. P.S. Mom, none of the above is true. But I got a C in sociology and the flunk chemistry class. I just wanted you to receive it in its proper perspective. <laughs> now, what do you think the parents might feel eventually? They are grateful, isn't it? Peace and comfort. It's really a smart kid, isn't it? Gratitude and happiness is really determined by our perspective in life, not by circumstances. So if we learn to be grateful people despite circumstances, we will be happier and be better person that God wants us to be when he created us. As the Bible says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Have you ever compiled a list for which we are grateful on Thanksgiving Day? Let me show you a part of the list that several housewives compiled. They wrote that they were especially thankful. The first, I'm thankful for automatic dishwashers because they make it possible for us to get out of the kitchen before the family comes back in for their after-dinner snacks. And housewives in America, they are grateful for husband 
who attack small repair jobs around the house because they usually make them big enough to call in the professionals. Housewives are grateful for teenagers because they give parents an opportunity to learn the second language. <laughs> they are thankful for smoke alarms because they let you know when the turkey is done. All right, now, if you began to make a list, what do you fill the lines with? What are you really grateful for? I'm sure my list would be um, with the, my family, include my family, and of course my newborn baby, my health, friends, and this country that I'm living in now, and my own country. And even more than that, I'm grateful for my church, our church family here, my salvation, the grace and God, and the grace and mercy of God. He always showers us showers upon me each and every day with his grace and mercy. And that is right, outside of the material possessions, with all my heart I believe we are a people, we are a nation that has truly been blessed by God. And we celebrate this on Thanksgiving Day. Let me ask you this. When we think of our forefathers from the Mayflower, who started the custom of setting aside a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God, is there anyone in this room who are thinking that we are more underprivileged than the pilgrims out of the Mayflower? Think for a moment. They had not enough food. They had no homes and no government agency to help them build homes. They had no means of transportation but their legs. The only food came from the sea and the forest, and they had to get it for themselves. They had no amusements, no television, no internet, no football, basketball, no movie or no TV shows, no music instruments. They had no means of communication with their friends and relatives in England. I can get in touch with my parents and my brothers and my friends in Korea anytime through the internet. They had no means of communication, no social security, or no Medicare. In the first winter in America, they were cold and starving, and they had to endure one of the harshest winters. And actually, so many people actually died, eventually. But we usually say they had four of the greatest human assets, initiative, courage, a willingness to work, willingness to go through, and a boundless faith in God. Our forefathers had a boundless faith in God, and it means that the very foundation of this country was built upon the conviction that we are the nation under the rule of God. And in a sense, Thanksgiving Day is a very distinctive holiday. It doesn't commemorate the victory in a battle or anyone's birthday or anniversary. It is simply a day set aside to express nationally and publicly. We express our thanks and gratitude to our Almighty God. Canada and Philippines and maybe Korea and America is the only countries who have this kind of holiday of thanksgiving to God. In 1789, George Washington made this public proclamation. Take a look, and I want you to find this strong and absolute acknowledgement of the fact of God and of the nations of dependence upon uh, God when I read the part of, the, part of that. George Washington said this, by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress, notice this, both houses of Congress, have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with the grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, 
to be devoted by the people of the states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all that we have, of all that is now and all that all will be. This is the foundation of this country. Next week, we will pause once again to celebrate Thanksgiving Day and we will remember who God was, what God has done for this country and in our lives, and who God is now, who God is doing for my life, and who God will be now and forever, what God is up to something for our lives. Today's passage, Psalm chapter 100, is one of the most beautiful songs of Thanksgiving, and it's exactly all about Thanksgiving Day. It says, we got here with the help of God, and He is the pro provider of every blessing we have. God is truly the source of our thanksgiving. Take a look. Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of pasture. God is your maker, and you are created in His image. God took every bone, every joint, and He welded them together with sinews and muscles, and covered them with skin, and gave us eyes that see, brains that think, and fingers that can pick things up. God made us inside and outside. It's a mystery. Some place along the way, He had us in mind, and He actually made us. And not just that, He's still making us new. We are on the process to be more like Jesus Christ. This is important. He's not satisfied with the unfinished product. He's not, not satisfied with your temper. He's not satisfied with the weak areas of your life. He's still making us. He's still working on our lives. Therefore, give Him thanks for who you are and who He is. And look at verse 5. Take a look. It says, For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It was written about 3,000 years ago, but the David said, His love and His goodness endures forever through all generations. 3,000 later, maybe, here in Savannah. This is our God. His character, His goodness and love endures forever because He is the same all the time. All things and stuff we have come and go. Your bank account will come and go. Your house, the possessions you have come and go. One day heaven and earth will fade too. But the Lord our God will still remain the same. When, where, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you did, God is faithful to love you and save you and bless you. Come, enter the, enter the gate with joyful songs and gladness. I pray that this will be a meaningful Thanksgiving season for you and for your family. Why don't you take time to read the book of Psalm chapter 100 again with your whole family on your Thanksgiving dinner table. You just gather your children, all your people, and just open the Bible, Psalm chapter 100, and read this one before the Thanksgiving table. And why don't you go around the table and share with your loved ones what you are really thankful this day and this year. When you do, I believe your heart and mind and spirit will overflow with thanksgiving to the Lord. May God bless you and your family, and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Amen.